I'm Eva Maria Arom, academy professor and now also an academician in science. The SMART bio program is very much related to sustainable bioeconomy, production of renewables, but also completely new bioproducts. And uh, all this is related to the climate change. The purpose of Finnish bioeconomy strategy and also the purpose of our program is not only to replace the fossil de derived materials with renewables, but it's also important to produce completely new products for uh, business and international economy. Uh, bioeconomy is, uh, if you think of bio, and everything what is used by bio is used by photosynthesis because uh, photosynthesis fixes uh, CO2 uh, from the air, it needs sunlight and water and it can produce it energy and it can produce different products depending what kind of metabolic pathways we then have. So bioeconomy produces all our food it produces feed for animals, it produces the energy what people need. It's the basis of our life. We can't use forest biomass, for example, for biofuels. We have to use it for more important purposes, to produce more high-value compounds. And therefore, we have to find out ways how to produce um, biomass in different ways. We can use new tools of science, what we have learned in basic research, and mimic the photosynthesis. We are completely dependent on photosynthesis, and that keeps us going. So it's so important, but it's also so complicated. Our science is progressing always when there are big new discoveries for the new equipments. The bigger resolution and the faster kinetics the better knowledge we get from photosynthesis. And uh, during these 40 years, we have learned so much. And then now we, we understand quite well how this capture of light energy takes place and how it's transferred to chemical energy. And those processes are similar. So if we go to cyanobacteria, the early oxygenic photosynthetic organisms, they evolved uh, 2.53 billion years ago. And since then, these basic reactions have not really changed. They are the same in the plants we have there, or you look at spruce or crops. But the regulation of these processes has changed a lot. There is an evolutionary trend how the regulation has changed when life have moved from oceans to the land. And now we can make use of these regulatory mechanisms. If we really want to do it well, so it needs a lot of basic research, we have to understand the uh, processes, mechanisms, what they are in living cells, and then how to change those processes to make them more efficient and to make them to produce the products what we want them to produce, which are more uh, most important for uh, sustainable bioeconomy. But when you want to, uh, to circumvent the biomass phase and get a more efficient system just using photosynthesis and then producing directly different products. So it takes much more time to develop these systems. I belong to the European Academies of Sciences Advisory Council. And this is the council of all uh, European academies. We make reports which are based completely on scientific research. And it's not, we don't make research for these reports, but we collect all research which is globally available and make these reports so that uh, to advise policymakers about the decisions so that it will advance in this respect now it will advance sustainable bioeconomy. When thinking of sustainable bioeconomy it also gives limitations for the uh, bioeconomy what the government has been thinking. So there are two sides uh, but we hope 
with time it gets better and better. This is a newest report about multifunctional forests. This emphasizes that uh, we should use our forests for uh, much better purposes than using them as a fuel, making ethanol or biodiesel or whatever. We should use uh, uh, our forests for much more sustainable products. The research in our group is focused on synthetic biology of cyanobacteria. This basically means that we want to find new tools to engineer the cells more efficiently. And we want to engineer the cells more efficiently in order to produce, generate new biosynthetic pathways for the production of desired metabolites. And in order to do this, we need fundamental information on the photosynthetic machinery and the metabolism in general. We need new preparative as well as analytical tools. And we need the know-how of how to engineer the new pathways into the cells. These organisms have a very unique biological capacity to produce hydrocarbons, alkanes and alkenes in their metabolism. Why do cyanobacteria produce these compounds? Because if we understood the biology, maybe we could actually more efficiently take advantage of the system. Maybe we could do targeted modifications to enhance the productivity. Or maybe we could gain more understanding on the main limitations and bottlenecks that are involved. And in order to do this, we of course need to cultivate the cells. We use different kinds of flask cultures in order to um, grow the cells in liquid and then which can then be taken for analysis or we can use these uh, specified specialized instruments called photobioreactors. We are using a photobioreactor which allows us to grow eight parallel cultures at the same time and we can regulate gas flow we can regulate the temperature and we can monitor the growth um, during the incubation. Then there are very specialized systems to study the different detailed mo molecular level effects that are taking place in the photosynthetic machinery. One of the key limitations currently is that the enzymes which are actually responsible for the key reactions in these pathways. They are very inefficient. So there have been many studies where different targeted modifications have been done on the key enzymes to actually enhance the activity of them. Other very crucial problem is that if we actually want to take benefit of these systems, we need to have a continuous production system, which basically means that we just grow the cells they produce the end products and we extract them while they grow. And we do not want to harvest the cells and break them open in order to get the products. If we could efficiently engineer more powerful systems, it would actually give many benefits for producing new renewable molecules. This also includes, for example, different industrial solvents which are needed in vast quantities or different uh, polymer precursors which could be used for making new renewable plastics for example. This covers all possible basic carbon-based products that we could imagine and this we feel is where synthetic biology can actually help us. In our group, we are studying microalgae and cyanobacteria as a model organism for basic photosynthesis and also we are studying them as production platform for different end products, high value products, beer fuels and so on. One of our current projects is hydrogen production from microalgae, from cyanobacteria and green algae. 
Microalgae have a very unique uh, capability. They can capture the light energy and they, re they can redirect that electrons to hydrogen. Uh, but cyanobacteria have a bad uh, reputation as a bad hydrogen producer for a long time. The one of the main main reason is that for a long time people were using just laboratory strains for hydrogen production and biodiversity has not been studied. And we have taken different approach because we have access to Helsinki culture collection and we have screened that culture collection. We found several good producers and one of those producers we have chosen as a model uh, and we have sequenced the genome of that strain. We have applied different synthetic system biology approach to find out what is making this strain best. And now we are uh, applying different approach to further optimize the system and to increase the hydrogen production activity of that strain. In order to improve hydrogen production from microalgae and cyanobacteria, we apply different approaches. And one of those approaches is the immobilization. And applying immobilization techniques helps us to get a more light per surface. And, and like this, that we can get, we can increase the light energy conversion efficiency. And those microalgae cells entrapped in microfilms can show up to 4.5% 4, 4 light energy conversion efficiency. And another advantage of the immobilization is that it can limit the biomass production. Like this, we can have a two stage. The first stage when we have a big biomass of the microalgae, and then we immobilize them and we go to the second stage when the cells are used just a, like a biocatalyst to convert light energy directly to the end products. Production of the um, different uh, uh, added value compounds from cyanobacteria and microalgae is not very cost effective. And that's why uh, combining wastewater streams for growth of cyanobacteria and microalgae is quite uh, important and it can be quite good uh, uh, approach. Because uh, now we have a collaboration with the industry partner Clover in Turku and together with them what we are using municipal wastewater where we grow the cyanobacteria and, and microalgae when the microalgae can uh, consume phosphorus and nitrogen uh, compounds from the wastewater and they can uh, make a high uh, um, biomass, efficient biomass for biodiesel and later on that biomass can be used for biodiesel production. We are, we are also evaluating uh, fatty acid co uh, composition of those microalgae for biodiesel production. Uh, we have recently nominated as a Nordic Center of Excellence uh, in North Forsk uh, Bioeconomy Program. And this is the called North Aqua Consortium. And the main aim of North Aqua Consortium is related to blue bioeconomy, blue biorefineries, to produce food, feed, high value products. and fuels. We are working on metabolic regulation in plant immunity. And uh, in this project, we would like to understand how plants utilize their metabolic machineries to defend themselves against infection. And uh, more specifically, we are focusing on the regulation of methionine metabolism and how that supports the biosynthesis of glucosinolates, which are the bitter tasting compounds that you find in different uh, cruciferous crops. So far, our research has focused on the role of protein phosphatase 2A in signaling networks that underlie plant acclimation to stressful conditions and also regulate metabolic processes in plant cells. 
PP2A regulates light acclimation and immune reactions in plants. And um, through these basic studies, we actually found that PP2A also regulates methionine metabolism and the formation of these bitter tasting glucosinolates in Arabidopsis leaves. We are utilizing the genetic toolboxes that are uh, publicly available for Arabidopsis thaliana. So Arabidopsis is a very handy tool to do all kinds of molecular work because there are thousands of mutants available in, in stock centers and the genomic sequence has been available already for quite some time. And it's very easy to do genetics with that species. And it's also easy to translate the findings that we make with Arabidopsis thaliana to other cruciferous crops that now include, for example, cabbage, broccoli and kale. And these cruciferous plants are the plant species that also produce glucosinolates. So the glucosinolates are typical of cruciferous crops. Currently, we use a lot of different kinds of uh, genetic and mutant approaches and especially different proteomics approaches. Targeted proteomics is one of the main tools that we use at the moment. And imaging of um, different protein localizations, for example, or different cellular structures is also very instrumental in our work. We do also work a lot with plant metabolomics, but here we come to collaborations Scientists at the Department of Chemistry are very helpful and collaborative in this research. We are very much interested in the chemical defenses of plants and how these compounds could be utilized in different beneficial means like in medicine or nutrition. So um, if our research is successful, we will be able to show how different light conditions, for example, modulate the contents of uh, methionine and its derivatives like folic acid or the health-promoting glucosinolates in different uh, cabbage or uh, broccoli or kale species. And this will have uh, immediate applicable uh, function and, and this will be applicable information. But uh, we would also like to identify completely new defense active chemical compounds from plants. And this might lead to discovery of completely new beneficial high value compounds from the plant uh, material. So my project focuses on photosynthesis and conifers and in particular the seasonal acclimation in winter and spring. Conifers, as any other land plants, have to deal with changes in the environment as they are sessile organisms. So plant plants have developed therefore mechanisms to cope with these changes in their environment. For example, light, temperature, water availability. I'm interested in spruce in particular because from the photosynthetic point of view, it is quite astonishing that they can keep the needles green in winter. It's not about why they keep their green, it's the question of how. Normally these conditions introduce severe um, or can introduce severe damage of the proteins, but spruce somehow can cope with that. And we don't know much about this acclimation mechanism, what exactly is involved, so we're trying to understand that. So but how normally plants deal with highlight stress, for example, is they, can, they have a mechanism to dissipate the excess energy that they receive very harmlessly, just as heat. This is called, it's a physical term called non-photochemical quenching, um, in which way they, yeah, they can activate it basically and that protects them from too much light. Now normally this process is engaged in a very short term. Um, so it's more used as a short term protection mechanism. You, in conifers, what we can observe is that they somehow engage a so-called sustained quenching, sustained non-photochemical quenching. We are using various techniques, as for example, I'm looking at the protein level, trying to describe the, photo the photosynthetic apparatus of spruce, using gel electrophoresis, separating these proteins, and then also using mass spectrometry to then identify these proteins. 
This gives us also um, a clue about phosphorylation levels because the mass spectrometry is very sensitive. So we can pick that up and from phosphorylation, which is known to play a key role in regulation of photosynthesis, um, understanding that better. I'm also looking at the functional characteristics using chlorophyll fluorescence and absorbance measurements to study the in vivo uh, mechanism. So I can take a needle and without interfering much with the system, look basically inside. And we do this, all these things on a seasonal scale to know what is happening in which part of the season and which stuff is changing. My research mostly focuses on basic research. Um, so I don't have a specific goal in mind when I uh, do my research. But what I can imagine is like the better we understand these acclimation mechanisms in, in conifers in general, not only spruce, um, the better we understand it, the better we can also predict how, for example, these trees are going to behave or like you can expand that to the um, ecosystem level even. So that might be interesting for forestries or um, other more applied researchers. If, they have a, if we can give them an understanding to then figuring out a better way of um, how, for example, Finnish forests will behave in the future. If you think about climate change, these models need a basic understanding of what is happening in the boreal forests also of Finland. So I see my research being in the first step to develop mechanisms to help understand the forest better.